Let me start by asking several guiding questions. How common is bacterial endocarditis? Who develops this disease and why? To answer the first question, fortunately, this very serious infection is relatively uncommon. The incidence is approximately two per 100,000. This means if you are a primary care physician, you are likely to encounter only one to two cases during your working lifetime. However, as you will hear later when we discuss the clinical manifestations, this disease is often included in the differential diagnosis of patients with fever. Endocarditis is more common in men than in women and is more in common in those over the age of 50. Thanks to the broad use of antibiotics to treat group A streptococcus, one of the leading diseases that predisposed to bacterial endocarditis, rheumatic fever is now rare in most regions of the world. As our population ages, thanks in part to the eradication of many fatal infectious diseases, the incidence of infective endocarditis, endocarditis is predicted to rise. How do patients develop endocarditis? As shown in this figure, we need to consider both the host and the bacteria. First, most cases of infective endocarditis are preceded by the formation of a predisposing cardiac lesion. When the endocardium of our heart valves is subjected to excessive and prolonged shear stress, the valve can become damaged. And this endocardial damage results in the accumulation of platelets and fibrin, producing what two of the leading investigators of this disease, Dr. Paul Beeson and Dr. David Durack, have called non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, or NBTE. This serves as the ideal site to trap bacteria that enter the bloodstream. We will talk more about this privileged environment when we discuss diagnosis and treatment in the third video. Today, lesions of the mitral valve and aortic valves are most commonly associated with endocarditis. Mitral valve prolapse at any age and calcific aortic stenosis in patients aged 60 to 70 are among the most common predisposing lesions as are bicuspid aortic valves in patients 50 to 60. Rheumatic heart disease is now rare, as are now a rare cause of mitral and aortic NBTE. In addition to the formation of an NBTE, sticky bacteria must enter the bloodstream. The major way these bacteria enter the bloodstream is through the mouth. In patients with poor dental hygiene, bacteria can enter the bloodstream from the gingiva and mucosa. Patients with poor dental hygiene and gingivitis are at high risk for this disease. And any patient with a loose rocking tooth is at particularly high risk for developing bacteremia. I recall a senior pediatric cardiologist who didn't have time to take care of a decayed tooth and that had become loose. While on a trip to Europe, he developed bacterial endocarditis, but more about him in our next video. Too often, we physicians and nurse practitioners and physician assistants fail to take care of ourselves. Bacteria can also enter the bloodstream during tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. In this era of heroin and prescription drug abuse, Inadvertent injection of contaminated solutions has led to an increased incidence of bacteremia, osteomyelitis, and endocarditis in these addicted individuals. Once the bacteria enter the bloodstream, where are they most likely to land? To answer this question, we all need to learn a little bit of physics and understand the Venturi effect. The Venturi effect develops when there is a high-speed jet stream. This high flow creates an area of low pressure adjacent to the area of high flow. 
One of the simplest examples of the Venturi effect can be seen in a stream with a rapid. The rocks constrain the flow of the water, creating a high-speed rapid. Directly downstream of the rocks, an area of low pressure develops, and that is where the twigs and debris collect. Similarly, when a heart valve malfunctions and does not open or close properly, an area of high-speed flow develops moving from the high-pressure chamber to the low-pressure chamber. And if bacteria, bacteremia develops, bacteria should deposit in the low-pressure chamber or site. For example, in aortic stenosis, bacterial vegetations develop in the aorta near the coronary cusps, while in mitral regurgitation, bacterial vegetations would be expected in the atrial side of the valve. Why are certain bacteria most commonly uh, cause endocarditis? Because they more readily adhere to surfaces. Streptococci, particularly strep viridens and strep bovis, produce a complex extracellular polysaccharide called dextran that coats their outer surfaces and allows them to adhere to an NBTE. Strep sanguis can bind to the receptors of platelets within an NBTE, and Staphylococcus aureus has fibrinogen and fibrinectin binding sites that allow them to adhere to the endocardium as well as to vascular endothelial cells. These characteristics explain why streptococci account for 60 to 80 percent of all cases of native valve endocarditis, and Staphylococcus accounts for 20 to 30 percent. Other pathogens, such as gram-negative bacilli and fungi, only rarely cause endocarditis. The microbiology changes when considering patients with prosthetic valves because these foreign objects can attract organisms with lower ability to adhere to surfaces. And we will discuss them in our treatment video. Now, I hope you understand how humans develop endocarditis. In the next section, we will discuss the symptoms and signs associated with this at times difficult to diagnose infection. Thank you.